Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Edges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. Today we're going to discuss Israeli military policy, in particular, how that policy is directed towards the subject population in the Gaza Strip, 1.8 million Palestinians trapped in the largest open air prison in the world. We're going to focus on the assault last summer that left over 2,000 dead, including over 500 children, uh, what that means for where Israel is going to go, and what that means for the Palestinians themselves. In the studio with me is Max Blumenthal, uh, the author of The 51-Day War, as well as Goliath, uh, which without question, I think, is the most important book on modern-day Israel. Thank you, Max. Thanks for having me. So we've seen, going back to 2006, a series of very heavy military strikes uh, carried out by Israel against a completely captive population in Gaza, 2006, uh, when they were attempting to free the Israeli soldier Shalit, 2007, uh, 2008 and 9 with cast lead, uh, Pillar of Cloud, 2002, and last summer, uh, the most uh, extensive assault on the Gaza Strip with protective edge. Why? Why does Israel keep using this kind of military force and why do they keep ratcheting it up? Well, it's fairly simple if you consider that the Gaza Strip has really been the base of the Palestinian armed struggle since the 1950s, and that Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have not relented in their quest to liberate themselves. And they've chosen to use arms as one method. Um, since the Israeli disengagement from Gaza in 2005, when several thousand fanatical settlers were pulled out by Israeli forces, um, and the Gaza Strip was occupied through the panopticon model, in, order, in other words, occupied from without, placed under siege, the attacks on the Gaza Strip have grown uh, more intense as the military, the armed factions in the Gaza Strip uh, underwent a process of militarization of their own in which they shifted from, you know, attacks on soft Israeli targets. Um, You're to, talking about like suicide bombing. Like the suicide bombing, for example. It was completely scrapped after 2005. Right. And f through the Philadelphia corridor in the southern city of Rafa, um, the Al-Qassam brigades, the military wing of Hamas, and other armed factions were able to actually import um, the kind of weapons that any guerrilla army possesses. Through tunnels. Through tunnels, mainly light weapons, right. um, you know, rocket-propelled grenades, and also they, they um, enhanced their production capacity of mortars and rockets. The rockets were able to reach longer distances uh, to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And the point was to challenge the Israeli military directly, which built up to what we saw in Operation Protective Edge, especially in the Battle of Shuja'ia. Meanwhile, the Israeli military adopted a doctrine um, which it named after a neighborhood in southern Beirut that it destroyed in the 2006 campaign the against Dahia. Hezbollah called Dahia. the Dahia Doctrine. This is a neighborhood in southern Beirut, Dahia, that was a base of support for Hezbollah. The neighborhood was completely destroyed by the Israeli Air Force, and it reflected the view of the, the, this operation to destroy this neighborhood, to attack the civilian population, reflected the view of the Israeli military intelligence apparatus, which was that it was, no, it was not going to be possible to militarily defeat and dislodge Hezbollah or Hamas, which was in control of the Gaza Strip um, since 2005, 2006. Um, Therefore, the civilian population had to be attacked in order to pressure it to give up support for the armed struggle, support for armed resistance, and to be pacified as the Palestinians inside the West Bank have been under the authority of the Palest under the control of the Palestinian Authority. So the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank coordinates with the Israeli military right. and is basically a native subcontractor right. for the occupation. Well, they carry out the security for on behalf of Israel. Exactly. For and which so, they receive a fair 
which they're paid. So the Dahia doctrine aims to, by attacking civilians, aims to demoralize mm. the civilian population until they assent to uh, the, the West Bank model. And what former Israeli Army Chief of Staff Benny Gantz refers to as mowing the lawn. And this means applying the Dahia doctrine every few years in order to grind down the resistance, as well as an intentional program uh, to uh, spur long, long-term long exhaustive uh, reconstruction processes that can't be comprehensively carried out. That was expressed in a paper produced in 2008 for the Institute for National Security Studies uh, by uh, former Israeli General Gabi Saboni called Disproportionate Force. And it, it directly calls for causing massive reconstruction well, what processes. What you see going back to 2006 is that it's not working. Uh, and in the incursion last summer, you had 68 Israelis killed, uh, which is a high number in Israel. Most of them were killed, were soldiers. They were killed by Hamas fighters inside Gaza. Um, and we have Israeli officials, Livni, uh, Avidor Lieberman, and others talking about another strike being inevitable. Right. I mean, the Dahia Doctrine has failed um, in almost every respect, which is why the violence intensifies each time. Mm. So in 2008, 2009, which was the first major assault on the Gaza Strip. This was the cast led. Cast led. Uh, we saw one family in particular uh, lose most of its members, the Samuni family, um, I think in Beit Hanun. In this assault, we saw um, over 50 families lose most or all members. Um, I saw in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, a report that 89 families were erased from the civil registry in the Gaza wow. Strip. Um, the Israeli human rights group Bet Selim concluded that the Israeli military had adopted an open fire policy that included targeting family homes. And if you understand how people live in the Gaza Strip, which is one of the most densely populated areas on earth. I mean, the homes are three to four, sometimes five stories high, and each story represents a generation of right. a family. So when it gets hit by a missile, you see a family liquidated. Um, a, a reporter I spoke to who was in Gaza before I was able to get permission to enter visited the home of the Batch family. The father of the family was the head of the police department in Gaza City, so he was targeted, the Israeli military. They, they, they love to kill cops. Um, they consider cops to be a military target. And so this is one of their cop killing operations. But they knew his whole family was in the house with him. They aimed to surprise them, of course, in order to eliminate their target. And when the reporter arrived, he found that over 20 members of this family had been killed in one strike. He found fingers on the ground, and he said that limbs were hanging from the trees. Um, so this violence is intensified, and it also um, has re it reached sectors of Gazan society that had never been attacked before, like the educated middle class, which lives in the soft heart of Gaza City. So not only were 20, was 20 percent of the entire area of the Gaza Strip reduced to rubble in the border areas, the areas bordering Israel, which are fortified by the armed factions in the Gaza Strip. These are where the tunnels are and so on. But we saw residential high rises in the center of Gaza City brought down towards the end of the war by a very frustrated Goliath, unable to mm. punish David into submission. And so Netanyahu, his approval, rating, his approval ratings were flagging. The Israeli public wanted more violence. He ordered strikes on, for example, Zafir 4, which is a 14-story residential high-rise inhabited mostly by people who support the rival of Hamas, Fatah. Uh -huh. He attacked Basha Tower, which is the oldest residential or the oldest civilian high-rise in the Gaza Strip, largest one, and it's home to the media. It's right. as if you know a foreign army brought down the CNN tower in Atlanta, or you know bombed us right now. I want to ask about the disparity between what Israel says it does and what it does. Um, even if you go on the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force website, it uh, goes on and on about how it protects civilians, it won't target families, uh, it cares about human rights. And yet, the reality on the ground, and you and I have been on the ground, is really just indiscriminate wholesale slaughter of primarily civilians, including children. Yeah, I mean, w the testimonies I gathered in the rubble were uh, described 
a sadism and savagery that I had never Give heard of before. Give me some examples of that. Um, I mean, we heard, we heard constantly about human shields. Right, which we should be clear were not being used by Hamas. Right, and, and it also it, 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 it contravenes the ethos of the, fight, the young men of the Al Qassam Brigades. Right. Their ethos is based on honor and bravery, and they would never put children in front of them when confronting Israeli soldiers. I mean, they pride themselves on confronting them directly in really daring operations. And you can see those operations on video for the first time, like the Nahal Az operation, where an uh, Al Qassam team tunneled into an Israeli military base in Israeli right. military in Israeli territory with GoPro cameras attached right. to their helmets, right. killed every soldier inside the base, took a Tavor rifle, and went back into the tunnel. I mean, this was a direct confrontation with the most powerful military in the Middle East, and they succeeded through the kind of um, you know cavalier attitude that they wanted to display and project to the outside world. I mean, and this is important if you understand from a Palestinian perspective that most of what you've seen throughout your life, either directly or on on YouTube videos or news reports, are Israeli soldiers humiliating Palestinians. Right. So now the tables are turned. But there was, but the ability of the armed factions to protect civilians from Israeli savagery inside the Gaza Strip was very limited. So you had instances in eastern Rafah, for example, where the Israeli military advanced on July 26th on the um, Abu Sa'id family home, took 30 members of the family out of the home on it during an iftar, during Ramadan, asked, does anyone speak Hebrew? The father answers in the affirmative. They shoot him in the chest and leave him to bleed to death. He miraculously survives. They send the family marching uh, towards the city of Rafa. This is kind of a semi-rural area. And they take 19-year-old Mahmoud Abu Sa'id into his home, strip him down, put him in a room with a muzzled dog, wrap him in a carpet. And then when they're ready, they take him out, stand him by the window, and shoot over his shoulders as they right. pick off his neighbors. And I heard story after story of human shields in the border regions of the Gaza Strip. These are human shields being used by a very cowardly Israeli military to protect themselves. Um, another instance was the Wahadan family in Beit Hanun who were ordered to stay in their house for a week as the Israeli military used it as a base of operations. And then when the military left, they called in artillery strikes, destroying the entire neighborhood in an hour. And when I arrived, uh, there were still young men, this is weeks later, looking for the pieces of a two-year-old member of this family, uh, Rena Wahadan, and her 52-year-old aunt, Baghdad. Um, the town of Hosea, on the, in the, which is a very small farming town, right hard, located hard against the Israeli border, one of the first areas that Israeli soldiers took, was placed basically under siege for 10 days. The Israelis declared it a closed military zone. The International Red Cross couldn't get in. It's during Ramadan, people are fasting, there's no water, no electricity. The town is being completely destroyed, um, and there are 7,000 people trapped with Israeli soldiers honeycombed within the town. And so you hear stories about, like, the Rujela family attempting to escape and leaving their daughter out on the road as they fall under attack mm -hmm. from a tank division. The daughter, um, Gadir, who's 16, is severely handicapped and is un severely dis physically disabled and unable to walk. She's in a wheelchair, and so she's left on the road in a wheelchair. And when the soldiers finally leave days later, she's found by her wheelchair on the road, alone, decomposing, riddled with bullets, along with many other bodies. Now, one of the few paramedics who was brave enough to attempt to get into this town of Hosea when it was under the closed military order um, was named Mohammed Matar Abadla. And um, actually, when we did a, a talk in Princeton, we one of his right. relatives right. spoke in the crowd. The talk. Yeah. And I interviewed two of Abadla's colleagues um, in Gaza City, and they told me what happened on July 26th when um, they went in their ambulance for the Palestinian Red Crescent to retrieve a body that had been lashed to a tree uh, by Israeli soldiers and shot in the leg. I don't know if the person was alive or not. Um, the Israeli soldiers told Abadla to get out of the ambulance. He's the driver. 
take a few steps forward, hold a lighter over his head, and then they shot him in the chest right. and executed him. And this happened on July 26th. So I, I, I wanted to understand why this was happening, just as I wanted to understand why I heard so many testimonies of men who um, said they spoke Hebrew and were shot by Israeli soldiers. Right, I was going to ask you about that. Now, I wasn't, una- I wasn't able to really determine why men were shot for speaking Hebrew, except that perhaps they could have been seen as you know, spies or people who can um, uh, translate and decode uh, communications, military communications. Israeli soldiers under their ethics code are given unlimited capacity to eliminate anyone who can be seen as a threat. So one thing they're told they can do is kill someone who is holding a cell phone. We saw in the Goldstone Report, the UN fact-finding mission on Operation Cast Lead, cases of men who were holding cell phones who were killed. You know, you're holding a cell phone, so you're seen possibly as doing command and control for the armed uh, factions. So I interviewed Colonel Desmond Travers, who's one of the four authors of the Goldstone Report. He's an expert in counterinsurgency, an Irish colonel. And he told me that one reason why the soldiers would ask Abadla to hold a lighter over his head is so they could say, yeah, we killed him, but we thought he was holding a cell phone and giving orders and calling in our location to armed factions in the area. So it was our mistake, but under the ethics code, we're authorized to kill anyone who could be seen as a threat. But but you did find that it was a pattern to shoot, I think you said, older men who spoke Hebrew. Yeah, I heard about cases in Hosea. Uh, Nasser Shamali is someone um, who was shot in Shujaia after sp- addressing soldiers in Hebrew. Do you have an, um, any idea why? And Dan Cohen, my colleague, actually tracked um, Shamali down af- and he, he was shot in the arm and the sol- soldier thought he was dead. Um, and we actually tracked him down and confirmed this. Um, there are other, and then I, I mentioned uh, Mahmoud Abu Sayyid's father and Rafa. So none of these people know each other, but right. they each described a similar situation. So the, the, the two theories are that, one, these, uh, the soldiers were frightened that these men could understand the orders they were giving to one another, and two, that the soldiers, who were themselves raised, raised under a regime of ethno-religious separation right. between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, are seeking to harden that regime mm. by sending the message that you will not help us we, and, and, and to send a message to an entire society that we don't want any involvement uh, between, uh, with you in, in our societies. Don't try to speak Hebrew to us. Don't try to help us. Here's what you get, um, which is something that we've seen throughout you know, colonial interactions with right. you know, natives who attempted to I, be. I want to ask you about the use of experimental weapons, which was true, I think, in uh, Cass Lead with Dime, which you wrote about, I believe you wrote that, about that in Goliath. Yeah. Um, but talk a little bit about the experimental weapons and, and then before we close, a little bit, because it's not working, and because we have seen senior Israeli officials talk about further massive military assaults as inevitable, where we're headed. Yeah. But let's talk about, just quickly, about the these horrific weapons that they're testing. I mean, they're using the the people of Gaza like guinea pigs. Well, um, since 2006, Israel has used uh, dense inert metal explosives, um, which were designed actually by um, you know figures in Israeli academia, um, including quantum physicists, in collaboration with the Israeli military, uh, to for, for assassinations. The point of these weapons is to um, generate a um, enough, a massive explosive capacity, but within a limited range to actually eliminate or limit civilian casualties um, to the target. Um, and I, I can't explain how they, these weapons operate. They're, they're, they tung- the they're tungsten tissue, based right? and they attack the soft right. tissue and cause death over a period of days. And the way that you identify the munitions is through a very small entry wound and then massive burning of the organs. We're talking about an entry wound that could be little more than one millimeter wow. wide. Um, so I interviewed Hani Shaniti, who's a doctor who's in charge of documentation at Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, who told me of 
um, as many as 20 injuries he treated like this. Sometimes if they can treat the organs immediately and, or, do, or perform you know, amputation, um, the patient can be saved, but often the patient will just mysteriously die after a few days with very little exterior um, uh, uh, wounds or very little injury to the skeleton. Um, Dr. Samir Holmes, who treated um, victims at his dental clinic and OBGYN clinic in central Rafah on Black Friday, August 4th in Rafah, after Israel threatened to bomb the main hospital, told me of these wounds before that he had never seen them. So this is an experimental weapon that's been tested in the Gaza Strip over the course of the last eight or nine years. Um, it's very uh, disturbing to hear about it, but then at the same time we see conventional weapons being tested. Right. Like, for example, the Spike 4 missile, which was used in the um, attack at the beginning of Operation Cast Lead in December 2008 on the police uh, cadet graduation ceremony in Gaza City, where dozens of police cadets were killed, scores were wounded, their organs and body parts were splattered um, across uh, an entire um, area. Um, while they were celebrating their graduation as police cadets to direct traffic and that right. kind of thing. So this is a, another example of mass cop killing. The missile that was used in that attack then appeared in international weapons fairs. And, you know, it's a good missile, you know, from a military perspective. It's not the best missile. It's a good missile. But what gives the Israeli military its advantage is that they can stamp this missile with the brand Field Tested. Well, we used with, it in this operation. It drones. was successful. You, the same with the drones. Yeah, the the the, Her, the Elbit Hermes 450 drone. Um, they're introducing the nine, um, Hermes uh, 900 drone now. These have been exported to Brazil right. to monitor the uh, World Cup, and you know there, the, is, Israel's now even at a weapon a recent weapons fair introduced uh, the suicide drone, which is a drone that uh, loiters over the target in the words of uh, Elbit Systems, and then crashes directly into the target with a nose packed with explosives. So these wars are necessary to test these weapons and then market them. The defense minister often goes into a role as a lobbyist for right. the weapons industry. Uh, Ehud Barak is a former defense minister who's become one of the wealthiest people in Israel um, through this kind of revolving door system. 150,000 families, according to Yotam Feldman, the Israeli journalist who's done the, some of the most research on the weapons export industry, subsist off of weapons exports in Israel. That's families. Right. And that means almost the entire upper middle class in Israel. So occupation, siege, and these mowing the lawn assaults have been incentivized for the Israeli economy and Jewish Israeli society. <laughs> and it makes them uh, very averse to peace deals it's become such a destabilizing force in the Middle East that I don't think that Washington knows what to do with it. And so the only answer that Washington has since it can't apply pressure, it's all carrot and no stick, is to propose to increase annual aid to Israel from three billion to 4.5 billion. Where does that aid go? Israel has the highest inequality rate in the OECD. It has massive child poverty in many of its peripheral cities. And that aid doesn't go to, for example, poor kids in Ashkelon, it, Israel is required to spend that the loan money, that aid money, in Texas and in Colorado right. and California on weapons. Where do the, what are those weapons going to be used for? Well, they're not going to be used um, in a conventional war against Iran. They're going to be used for more mowing the lawn assaults on the Gaza Strip, um, and it will fuel the Israel Israel's own weapons industry. The only thing I can see. Uh, interfering with another assault on Gaza is the fact that negotiations are taking place now um, to either end or relieve the siege. Um, and we'll have to see where those go. But these, you know, the discussions are based around a possible five-year truce between Hamas and Israel. Well, Israel's broken truces well, more than once. I I exactly. And, you know, if you look, if you just look at what's happened since uh, September 1st or September 2nd of last year when the ceasefire went into effect between Hamas and Israel. Hamas has kept the siege faith. They've kept the, the ceasefire faithfully and Israel has um, attacked repeatedly right. fishermen. They've attacked farmers in the buffer zone and you see these, um, you know, Salafist extremists who have allied themselves with ISIS inside Gaza 
firing rockets into open areas in Israel. And how does Israel respond? By attacking Hamas. Right. So it's kind of like Hamas is being uh, is stuck between of uh, ISIS and Israel, um, who are acting at least right now in kind of a tacit collusion to tighten that vice. Thank you, Max. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Had to eat out the watermelon patch. And you know they put me in a shack. Stole my name.